السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وبعد We continue with the praise of Allah and sending our prayers of peace upon the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is our third session in um, looking into the Majmu'ah of Imam Al-Nawawi and into his introduction of the importance, virtue of knowledge and scholarship. And uh, he continues in his fasl, in his next chapter by saying, I'lam, have full knowledge, have full awareness. Anna ma dhakarnahu min al-fadli fi talab al-ilm inna ma huwa fi man talabahu muridan bihi wajh Allah Taala. Have full knowledge that everything that we have previously mentioned, all these verses, all these hadith about the ants and the fish making du'a for the one seeking knowledge, all of these virtues that we have mentioned, is only specific. To those who attain knowledge for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لا لغرض من الدنيا Not for any share from the worldly life. ومن أراده لغرض دنيوي The one who seeks this religious sacred knowledge. Seeking it for a temporary worldly benefit. And he begins to list what these benefits could be. Kamal, in terms of wealth, or riyasa, or authority, or mansib, or position, or wajaha, status, or shuhra, famousness and celebrity, or qahr al-munadhirin, or to show his, his, uh, his ability to subdue those who debate him, or nahwi thalika fahuwa madhmoom, or anything of the sort, then let that person know, and let those categories of people who seek knowledge for these aims know that they have been humiliated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reality. Allah says in the Quran, مَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ حَرْثَ الْآخِرَةِ نَزِدْ لَهُ فِي حَرْثِهِ The one who wishes to have a harvest and prosperity in the next life, we will give him more than what he anticipates. وَمَنْ يُرِيدُ حَرْثَ الدُّنْيَا but as for the one who wishes to cultivate and take his harvest and take his reward in this worldly life, نُؤْتِهِ minha, He will have a share of it. وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِن نصيب, And nothing will be given to him in the next life. Also, وَقَالَ تَعَالَى وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ And the word ikhlas means in this Seeking that which is only for Allah for him and removing from it that which is given to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He then begins to narrate to us some terrifying hadith, such as the hadith of Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu, which is narrated in Sahih Muslim and other books where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Inna awwala man nar, of the first types of people, the first person, the first category of person who hellfire will be kindled upon, who Jahannam will blaze upon, meaning Jahannam is dormant, but when you add this fuel to it, the first fuel, it will blaze up into a fire. Who is that first type of person? Is it the person who's a liar or a cheat or an adulterer or this or that? No. Awwaluman, the first of them. رَجُلٌ آتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْعِلْمِ An individual whom Allah has blessed and shown and given the virtue of knowledge. فَتَعَلَّمَ الْعِلْمَ وَعَلَّمَ And that individual acquired knowledge and was given a platform to teach it to others. وَقَرَأَ الْقُرْآنِ And became fluent in the reading and the memorization of the Qur'an. فَأُمِرَ بِهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ On the day of judgment from the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu He will be the first person to be brought up. You alright? Jazakallah khair. Even without asking. That's wonderful. That's ukhuwa. That's called unagi, thinking together. Well done. Alhamdulillah. So the one who has been given this virtue of knowledge and memorization of the Qur'an and its understanding will be brought in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment. فَعَرَّفَهُ اللَّهُ نِعَمَهُ فَعَرَفَهَا And Allah will display the virtue of what He had. 
Allah will say, look what I gave you. Look at what you have been blessed with. Look at the opportunities that you had to earn so much reward. فَمَا عَمِلْتَ فِيهَا What did you do with this knowledge? So that individual will say, قَالَ تَعَلَّمْتُ الْعِلْمَ وَعَلَّمْتُ My Lord, I learned and I taught. وَقَرَأْتُ فِيكَ الْقُرْآنِ And I recited the Qur'an for you, O Allah. قَالَ كَذَبْتُ it will be said, you are a liar. You learned as a base reason, the main reason was not the knowledge, but so that people would value you for your knowledge. People will hold you in esteem because you were the person they could turn to. You were the person they could ask help from. You were the one that people gathered around. You were the one that people favored. فَقَدْ قِيل It was said to you, you are this and this and this. وَقَرَأْتُ الْقُرْآنِ And I read the Qur'an for you, Allah. No, وَقَرَأْتَ لِيُقَالَ قَارِئًا You recited so that people will praise your recitation. How wonderful he sounds. How great he, he, his knowledge is. فَقَدْ قِيل It was said to you. فَأُمِرَ بِهِ Meaning that was your reward. The reward was what you thought, you sought. You wanted people to acknowledge you, you got it. You wanted to be uh, recognized, you were given it. You wanted people's praise, so it was showered upon you. People's awe of you, it was given. And that was the main aim of the reason for your acquiring and dispensing of knowledge. فَقَدْ قِيلْ You've received it. فَأُمِرَ بِهِ It's ordered that he be put on his face. وَسُحِبَ إِلَى النَّارُ عَلَى وَجْهِهِ and dragged to Jahannam upon his face in humiliation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from this. The Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continues in other hadith where he says, Man ta'allama ilman. The one who learns and values knowledge, ilman, it's something sacred. Mimma yubtagha bihi wajhullah. That should only be learned for seeking Allah's face and seeking Allah's pleasure. لا يتعلمه إلا ليصيب به عرضا من الدنيا. But that individual only learned it because there was some advantage he could gain in this worldly life. لم يجد عرف الجنة يوم القيامة. يعني ريحها. That man, that woman, will not be able to smell the scent of Jannah. Won't even be able to smell it. It will be like they cannot recognize where it is or how to get there. And you know, the Arab, when they would talk about scent, they would, refer it, they would prefer it to vision. They would say, you can smell something even though it's obscured from you. You know, you, you, draw, you come home and you know you're, uh, someone's been cooking, you can smell, you know what's there before you get in. And it's like Jannah, you will sm smell it 40,000 years ahead of you entering it. You know, it's 40, 40 years distance before you get there, you can smell it, its scent and its virtue. And there are those who smell Jannah before their departure. And it is narrated in Sahih Hadith, in Sahih al-Bukhari, during the battle of Uhud, one of the Sahaba, he came late. And he came late to the battle of Uhud. And this was after the turn, the tide had turned. And Khalid had encountered and encircled the Sahaba and the Prophet ﷺ. And after the death of Hamza, many of the Sahaba, including Umar ibn al-Khattabi radiallahu anhu, alqaw ma bi'aydihim, they put down their shields and swords because someone falsely had said, Muhammad has been killed sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He hadn't. But someone made this false claim and some of the Sahaba believed it. So they sat on the ground crying. Anas ibn Nadr radiallahu anhu. He comes up late from Medina, running to catch up, and he says to them, Ma bikum, what happened to you? Why are you doing this? Qalu mata Rasulullah. We heard the Prophet is dead, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He said, Wa ma ta ta tasnauna bi hayatim baada mauti Rasulillah. What are you going to do with a life after he's died? Qumu wa mutu ala ma mata alayh. Stand up and fight for what he died for, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So they got their vigor and stood up and they brought back and pushed back the mushrikeen who began to encircle the Prophet ﷺ. As Anas came close to al Madina, he said to the Sahaba, Wallahi inni la ajidu riha al-jannati duna uhud. By Allah, 
I smell Jannah near that mountain of Uhud. I can smell it. As he was going on his way, and as he hurried up, he was martyred there, and they could not identify his body except Bibanani, the smallest finger. Only a sister that, you know, the butchers, uh, we know what they did to Hamza radiallahu anhu and the other Sahaba. They butchered him radiallahu anhu to such a degree that there was nothing recognizable of his, him except his sister could recognize him by his smallest finger and the ring he wore on it. Radiallahu anhu wa arfa. Right? So there are those who smell its scent even from the dunya before the akhirah. So the Prophet ﷺ says that these people who learn knowledge for other than the face of Allah, even in the akhirah, will not be able to smell it. Some of the imams, such as al Imam al-Nawawi in another one of his books, Sahih Muslim's explanation, he says that even in Jannah, they will be forbidden from its scent. Even after Allah allows them into Jannah, due to the statement of the Prophet, he interprets it that even in Jannah, they are barred from some of its joy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Another hadith of the Prophet sallam, to show the seriousness of this matter, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ طَلَبَ الْعِلْمَ لِيُمَارِي بِهِ السُّفَهَاءِ The one who acquires knowledge so that he can show himself as being above the foolish. He wants to distinguish himself. Oh, I know more than these people. وَيُكَاثِرْ بِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ And so that he can come and sit amongst the scholars and pretend to be one of them. أَوْ يَصْرِفْ بِهِ وُجُوهَ النَّاسِ إِلَيْهِ or so that people, instead of turning to one person, will turn to him in place of them. Let him be ready for a seat in, his, in hellfire, in Jahannam. May Allah protect us from this. And this is from the statement of Ka'b ibn Malik in, in At-Tirmidhi. A final statement that Imam al-Nawawi will look at is the statement of Ali radiallahu anhu. And I want you to make note of the precision of Ali radiallahu anhu's words. He says, Ya hamalat al-ilm. O those who are the carriers of knowledge. I'malu bima alimtum. Act in accordance to what you know. Wal yuwafiq ilmukum amalukum. And let your knowledge equate to deeds. What you know, put an equal sign, muwafaqa, with what you do. وَسَيَكُونُ أَقْوَامًا Because I worry of what I know will come. There shall definitely be groups of people يَحْمِلُونَ الْعِلْمِ Who are endowed with knowledge, who have knowledge. Who know a lot of things. لا يجاوز تراقيهم But everything they speak with their mouth has never passed their throat. It's in their head, but it's not in their heart. It's in their mind and on their tongue, but not in their heart. What are their signs? How do you know these people? يخالف عملهم علمهم You will see that what they do is different to what they know. ويخالف سريرتهم علانيتهم And what they are privately engaged in is different to what you witness publicly. يجلسون حلقا They will sit in groups and, 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 and teaching other people in a halaqa. يباهي بعضهم بعضا Competing with others who teach similar to them. حتى إن الرجل لا يغضب على جليسه أن يجلس إلى غيره ويدع They will be so coveting of attention that the one who sits with them and learns with them, if they learn from someone else, it angers them. How come you're listening to, why didn't you come to, you went to his class instead of my class? It upsets them that they will learn from someone other than them. 
أولئك لا تصعد أعمالهم إلى السماء Know for certain that this type of scholar these type of people their deeds will never rise up to the heaven meaning will not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so those are serious words of this great sahabi and the khalifa of the prophet Muhammad sallallahu anhu that there are traits that show that there is a difference between those who learn for Allah and those who learn for other than Allah so the next chapter by Al-Imam Al-Nawawi, he begins now to teach us what are the levels of knowledge. So this chapter that we begin, Bab Aqsam Al-Ilm Al-Shar'i, which is the levels of religious knowledge. Many people always say, Brother Yahya, I want to learn about Islam. What should I learn? What should I do? Where do I begin? What's most important? What's least important? What will I get the most reward for? Is there a difference of what I learn as a man in comparison to that as a woman? Do I need to learn fiqh first? Do I have to know what the Quran means first? Should I study Arabic first? Let's hear what the ulama of the past said. So Imam al-Nawawi says, Hiya thalath. There are only three broad categories, three levels of religious instruction. Al-Ula, the first of them, Fardu Ain, is an obligation on everyone. Just because you're a Muslim, you have to attain this knowledge. So here's the answer to that question. What should I learn first, brother? What, what do I need to know? What is compulsory? Well, here it is. This is Fard Ain, a personal obligation. Wahua ta'allum. It is to learn. What is taklif? What is an obligation of worship? مَا لَا يَتَأَدَّ الْوَاجِبُ الَّذِي تُعِيِّنَ عَلَيْكَ إِلَّا بِهِ It is to know that which without it you cannot perform the wajib. It is to know the things that if they are missing, you cannot perform the obligations of your worship to Allah. كَكَيْفِيَّةِ الْوُضُوءِ The perfection of wudu, وَالصَّلَاةِ And the fulfillment of the prayers. And I, I know you're going to say, Brother Yahya, we all know how to make wudu. Do we? Now, I'm not saying that you haven't been making wudu correctly. But do you make wudu the way the Prophet made it? Properly made it with the spirit he intended, keeping in mind the hadith of Al Imam Ibn Majah. Although some scholars have said that it's da'if, that the truth is it is a sahih, it is a correct hadith, and it's been deemed authentic by contemporary scholars. Where the Prophet said, Don't waste water even if you're in the middle of a river, don't waste water for wudu even if you're in the middle of a river. Even if a river is flowing by. Do you know how much water the Prophet made his wudu with? How much? Two handfuls of water. His whole wudu. So if you put water in my hands here, you filled it up once, and you filled it up twice, that was the wudu of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Can I have an assistant? We just make a quick wudu. Can you pour water for me? All right. I'll stand there, inshallah. Now we're not going to... Oh, no, no, this water's enough. You don't need more than that, Akhi. <laughs> Half a cup is enough. Now I'm not going to wash my feet if that's okay. All right? All right. Can you stand on this side, inshallah? Is it okay if we make a little wetness? Okay. It won't be too much. Slowly. <laughs> Remember, we said two handful. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah, this is too much. That's way too much. We're dripping too much. All right, go. That's it.
little more. That's it. Now I'm just doing it one cycle instead of two or three, but you can do it more. Looks like I just come out of the shower, huh? Just a, just a tad. That's it. It's only mess. That's it. All right, I'm not going to do the feet. How much is left from that half cup of water? A lot. Le still left, right? Jazakallah khair. Now, that is the intent. That is the intent of the wudu of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The wudu of the Prophet sallallahu was one who lived in a desert. Do you understand? They didn't turn on water and watch Niagara Falls. And I know, alhamdulillah, you, I know it's Kuala Lumpur, you're blessed with rain. I know. But the, there is a difference between making wudu and making wudu according to what the Prophet wanted you to do. And therefore when we say to learn wudu, it's not to learn what to do, but it's to learn why it was done the way he did it. How he did it the way it was sent. Kayfiyyat al wudu The proper wudu of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When you look at this and you look at salah and you look at the other things, you find that the necessary things that we should be teaching our children, our wives, our husband, our communities are missing. There are essentials in our ibadah that is ilmun bid darura has to be something we learn in our faith that is missing. And therefore Imam al-Nawawi says, it is a must for us to learn the proper sifa. Why do we use the word sifa? Description of the wudu of the Prophet When the Prophet made wudu, he didn't just make wudu for himself. He would say, come, let me teach you how Jibreel taught me to make wudu. He would say to them, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Pray the way you saw me. Pray. Right? So there is this history of sacred knowledge that we know in the books but does not translate into our deeds. We know wudu, but we don't know wudu. When you walk into a masjid and you see someone turn on a tap and he's making wudu, you don't be upset now in Malaysia. Don't be upset with me. Every time I walk into a masjid, it's always wet. The, the place for wudu and the, play in the, and the restroom, always wet. Why? Flooding. Fly, <laughs> flooding. <laughs> You're used to floods. <laughs> Allah protect us and you, ameen, ya Rabbi. Why is there water everywhere? This was not the way of the Prophet Muhammad He would make his whole wudu in less than four single scoops of one hand or two handfuls of water. This was the whole wudu of the Prophet Muhammad including his head and including his feet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as you saw this half cup of water, we only used maybe 100, 200 mil of it. He would use at most sallallahu alayhi wa sallam two, three hundred mil, right? For his whole wudu. How much for ghusl? Allahu Akbar. La, you know, his whole, we, we turn on the shower and we say, you know, singing in the shower, right? The, wudu, the ghusl of the Prophet وسلم, he and Aisha, they would use one, one, one pot of water, one little cistern of water. He and her, they would both make their wudu from it. The wudu of the Prophet وسلم, no drops would touch the ground. Because the Sahaba, they would take it. <laughs> I, they wouldn't let anyone, this is the wudu of the Prophet وسلم, right? Nothing would go empty from his wudu, peace and blessings be upon him. So it's important to understand, when we talk about this, we're not just talking about, oh yeah, yeah, I know how to make wudu. No, we're talking about learning the etiquette of wudu. Learning how it's done, why it's done, what is the spirit, what are the dua in it. Why do we say this dua and not this? What is authentically reported, what isn't? There is an importance in understanding the clarity of this. And it is this that we see that statement of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
على كل مسلم. Seeking knowledge is fard, obligatory upon every Muslim. Man and woman. This is the knowledge he was speaking of. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Al-Imam al-Nawawi continues. وقد بلغ بالغ إمامنا الشافعي رحمه الله تعالى في تحريم الاشتغال بالعلم بعلم الكلام أشد المبالغة. He says those essentials of worship and faith became the criteria of sacred knowledge, and all of the other talk, kalam, all of the other extra verdicts that are derived and the things that are additional to the basis. that everyone should know is something that is to be abstained from except from those who are experts in it. And Imam al-Shafi'i, he says, was quite critical and has made tahreem upon a person diving into secondary matters when they don't understand the preliminary matters. What does that mean? It means, my dear brother, my dear sister, if your wudu is not done well or you don't know how it's done well, or there is benefit that you can learn. If you haven't practiced the salah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as he prayed it, know its evidence, know the dua recited in it, know the meanings of them, you don't have any room now to go into things that are beyond those essentials. This is where you should be focused. Don't get distracted now with secondary things when this primary fard ayn has not yet been met. He continues by saying, Al-Imam Al-Ghazali rahimahullah, in the end of his life, he wrote his famous book, where he spoke about why we should not get into frivolous debate. and the words of philosophers and philosophy and things of this nature. وَذَكَرَ أَنَّ النَّاسَ كُلُّهُمْ عَوَامٍ Imam al-Ghazali's opinion and that of Imam al-Shafi'i and the Shafi'i madhab is that everyone, you and I, all of us together are general in our knowledge of al-Islam in those issues that relate to the secondary principles beyond those obligations that we must learn about. غير الفقهاء Other than those who have reached the level of fiqh. Over lunch, some of the brothers were saying, Brother Yahya, you know, can someone who teaches about Islam and stuff, do we call them fuqaha? And the answer is no. A faqih is not just someone who teaches the awam. The faqih is the one who teaches the fuqaha. Right? So if someone is sitting with the awam, with the general public like you and I, their level is not that of the faqih. The faqih is the, is the teacher of the scholars, right? These are heavy, heavy, heavy places and heavy topics that we have in, in, in reserve in our stance as Muslim. So the first level is to know about the obligations. In that is the most important obligation, which is a tawheed. which is, who is Allah? And how is Allah relevant to my life? And how is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a part of the, the fabric of everything that I am seeking is that which brings me towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore when the Imams talk about that which takes you away from Allah and polemics and argumentation and debate and philosophy, they're not talking about things that are studied for knowledge and logic, They're talking about things that lead people away from that essential which is Tawheed. He then speaks about something that I must share with you and we'll end with this before Salatul Asr. He says when he is speaking, when he's saying that it is essential to know about Allah, he says, وَاخْتَلَفُوا فِي آيَاتِ الصِّفَاتِ The scholars have disagreed about The, the attributes of Allah. We know who is Allah. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself in a way, or the Prophet describes him, himself in a way, 
the scholars have disputed in how this should be approached. And he continued to say, فَقَالَ قَائِلُونَ Some said, تَتَأَوَّلُوا It should be interpreted. And the attribute should be turned to show a particular meaning. وَهَذَا أَشْهَرُوا And this is the famous position of المتكلمين of those who delved into the philosophical issues. وَقَالَ الْآخَرُونَ But the others, they said, لا تتأول. The words that describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not be given an assigned meaning. وَيُمْسَكُوا عَنِ الْكَلَامِ And everyone should keep their mouths closed. فِي مَعْنَاهَا In attributing a meaning. وَيُوَكَّلُوا عِلْمُهَا إِلَى اللَّهِ and they should leave the matter to Allah wa uh, ila Allah ta'ala wa yu'taqad ma'a dhalika tanzihuhu subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the same time they should assume that Allah is beyond his creation and different to his creation he continues and says laysa ka mithlihi shay Allah there is nothing from his creation that is similar to him and he says, وَهَذِهِ طَرِيقَةُ السَّلَفِ And this is the path of those who came before us, أَوْ جَمَاهِيرِهِمْ And the majority of them, وَهِيَ أَسْلَمْ And that is the correct of the two opinions. Meaning that we do not assign an attribute. We don't say, Allah said about himself such, which means or could mean or it signifies this. So a quick example of this is that Allah in the Qur'an often refers to himself, uh, with an attribute. So he will say, Yadullahi fawqa aydihim. The hand of Allah, and the scholars they teach us that we should put our hand away from the sight of those who we speak to about it. The hand of Allah, we hide our hands. The hand of Allah is above their hands. And then we put our hands out. Is above the hands of the Sahaba. This is a statement in the Quran. Yadullahi fawqa aydihim in Surah Al Fatih. The hand of Allah is above their hands. No one ever understands that the hands of the Sahaba and the hand of Allah is the same. Although Allah uses the same word for both. Right? Allah uses that word here and uses that word there. They do not mean the same thing. No one would say, oh, therefore Allah, He's talking about His power or it's different. You have to make an interpretation and clear. As Al Imam al Nawawi here says, and others they say, you leave that matter to Allah. You say, Yadullahi, you don't say the power of Allah. You leave it. Allah said, Yad, we don't know what it means. Now, I want you to understand this. It doesn't just relate to Allah. Allah talks about the angels. He says in Surah Fatir, the first ayahs, Ja'ilul Malaika, Allah created the angels. Mathna wa thulatha wa ruba. They have two wings, three wings, four wings. Ajniha, uli ajniha. They have many wings. Now, what are the wings of an angel? Is it like those cartoons, like uh, dove wings? Is it like the wings of a plane? What wings are they? Is it the wings of a kite? A wings of a bird? What does it mean? Those who fell into error in previous nations, in Judeo-Christian tradition, what did they assume? They heard that Jibril has wings. What did they draw? Wings, they drew the wings of a bird. As Muslims, we don't assign any meaning like that. Why? Look at how Allah uses the word jinah in the Quran. He says jinah about birds. That they flap their wings and it's Allah that holds them in the heavens. Right? That's one. He talks about the angels that have wings. Then he talks about me and you. Where he says to us in the Quran, وَاخْفِدْ جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ for your mother and father, lower your wing of mercy. I don't have a wing, right? The word is the same, but the meanings are different, right? Allah says to Musa, put your hand fi janahik, put it in your wing. Musa doesn't have a wing, it means your pocket, that area between your arm and your underpit. That becomes the wing, it's attributed that meaning for Musa alayhi salam. So we do not say wing, 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 it's all the same, right? Words have different meanings. Finally, especially when it comes to the Sharia, we have a principle in our legal system 
that says al kalam yuhmal words should be carried to the meaning of the time and the place they are used so my brother he brought me some coffee jazallah khair you will find some ulama in the early centuries of islam they said al qahwa haram coffee is haram bismillah <laughs> What does that mean? Coffee is haram. Allahu Akbar, brother, you just took a drink. What did it mean? At their time, at their time, in their place, coffee was a liqueur. It was fermented. So when you read a book and it says, Al Qahu Hara, A'udhu Billahi Min al Shaytan al Rajim, right? It means something different to them than what it means to us. And you find this problem emerging often in mistranslations. In the Quran, in Hadith, I opened up uh, Riyadh al-Salih, I was standing in a masjid and was waiting for the Iqamah. And they had Riyadh al-Salih, so I opened, I was reading, and I opened the book, and it's an English translation. And I, I, it said, the Prophet loved to eat curry. I thought to myself, curry? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, curry? What? Now let me read the Arabic to this, turn the page. And what does it say? That the Prophet ﷺ, he used to love the stew that the meat was boiled in. You know how the shurba, the stew. Where do you think that translator was from? What country do you think? <laughs> it's gotta be one country. It's gotta be India or Pakistan, right? For him, curry is the only explanation. The Prophet liked the stew of boiled meat. That's curry, brother. So he wrote curry. Now if, you, if you're a new Muslim and you read, wow, curry is sunnah. I gotta eat some curry, right? That's what happens. So the words are given a meaning other than what they imply. In translations, you have to be very careful, right? We will continue with the intent, with the second level and third level of knowledge that is spoken of by Imam al-Nawawi after Salatul Asr. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته